Babylon Bee reminds us that baseball has long been considered the national pastime of the United States, but many modern audiences now believe the sport is too slow moving to be enjoyable since the sport takes a modicum of effort to follow and understand. New surveys show that Americans' favorite entertainment is the much faster moving and varied entertainment of getting mad at stupid nonsense they read about online. So, in light of what the Babylon Bee reminds us, we're here today to bring together a very bizarre message. We're going to be talking about how the church should respond to things in the world, how we can go out and preach the gospel, because in the end, we have to answer this question. What matters more to us as Christians, a soul of one of God's children or the affairs of an earthly nation? The church is always tempted to become activists for difficult political and social causes. However, this is not the purpose for which the church was commissioned. If something is actually a cause or a movement of God, and by that I mean we can actually open up our scriptures and find that a particular cause or movement is aligning completely with the gospel of Christ Jesus that has been revealed to us, then we should ask ourselves, why is this a separate cause? Why is it some secular movement or why is it something which we have to step into in activism? Why do we need to segment this off and make it its own category? Why is this not just simply the work of the gospel? Because the truth is, is if something is actually of God, then it is of God and it is just the work of the gospel. The morals and values of God are to be embraced because they are of God, not because we think we can sell people on their effects or we think that we can sell people on feel-good intentions or things that are not really of God. The gospel of Christ Jesus is something which is powerful. It's powerful enough to shape cultures and it does so through transforming souls. This is what we are called to do. This is what really matters. Oddly enough, this will have a bigger effect on politics and culture than doing political and social activism. Why? Because hearts and minds are more important than politics and culture. And hearts and minds produce politics and culture, not the other way around. So thank you for joining us and welcome to Kingdom of the Logos, a Christian program of critical thinking and adventure. And today we're going to be talking about that exact thing the Babylon Bee was talking about there where everybody's kind of entertained by the nonsense and yet we're not entertained by it at all. We all just want it to go away. And we're going to talk about today how the church should be asserting the gospel and not wanting to compromise with different political and social causes. And we're not going to spend too much time on that. We are going to dive deep into the gospel of Matthew chapter 17. So thank you for joining us. I am Pastor J. Dylan Proctor, and there's one other pastor here with me in the studio today. Pastor Anthony Alegria. And Pastor Anthony, would you have an opening prayer for us today as we get ready to open our program? Yes. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, may the meditations of our hearts, both in this studio and in the audience, and the words of our mouths be pleasing in thy sight, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. So thank you for being here with us. I know this takes time out of your day, and I hope that we are giving meaningful enough content for you to listen to and stay with us. And by the way, if you do like our content and you're watching on Facebook, which is where a lot of our audience is, please go to our YouTube channel and watch some of our videos there. Grab links from there and share with your friends. Our YouTube channel kind of struggles to grow, um, and by that I mean it struggles really hard to grow. We would appreciate any help and assistance there. And again, reach out to us. We want to have that engagement. We want to hear from you. We want to hear your questions so we can respond to them. Occasionally, we do a whole program responding to people's questions, so we do enjoy getting them. And today, we're going to be giving a bit of a prequel message to the message I gave Sunday, which was called The Children Are Not Forgotten. And today, I want to share a little bit of, of cool, good news where the, the gospel has really been working in the, the world around us. So for those of you who were here with me when I gave the Sunday message, the children are not forgotten, you know, it was a very serious message. It was one that had a lot of gravity to it. It was very tragic. And I shared that the with you all the story of um, from the movie 1917 where there's a, a young child that has milk brought to it and you're wondering whether or not the child will survive. And I shared with my own family history how my great aunt Anne, when she was in Germany, she watched as her baby brother passed away because her mother could not produce milk for the baby. So it's a very tragic thing that we, we see these things go on in the world and it leaves people in a place wondering, can God come to deliver people? Well, last Sunday I was also preaching at a nursing home which is nearby, and I go over there quite often, I get things ready and set up, and of all things providential, and again, this is not coincidence, this is not accident, but I'm going in there getting ready for the message and had just got done preaching that very somber message I delivered online and then here locally at the church where I pastor, 
And this lady comes up to me, no idea what I've preached, no idea what I'm about to preach. And she comes over to me and she says, preacher, I just want to tell you, I'm German. And when I was two years old, someone brought me out of Germany so I would not have to grow up in World War II. And she came out of Germany in the early 1940s, right when the Nazis were really at the peak of their power. So praise be to God, God does deliver children. And see the providence of just after I gave that message, someone come and tell me how God had delivered them from that was just absolutely miraculous. Pastor Anthony? Uh, And to be clear about that, just after he gave that message, somewhere else, someone came to him and told him that without having heard that message. Yeah, didn't hear the message. And a lot of people really here in this church, they were really wondering the question, where is God's hand in this? Where is the meaning? Well, God's hand is there with us, whether it be to collect us when we fall and stumble and we, we pass away. Even when children pass away prematurely, God's hand is there, and God's hand is there to deliver us throughout eternity. So this coming up week, I'm going to give another message expanding on that. But today, we're going to go a different route. We're going to be in Matthew 17. But let's backtrack to that opening statement I had. Um, When I was looking at the Babylon Bee, oddly enough, the message I had prepared for tonight was out of the phone book. If y'all can believe that. You can go home and give praise to God that you didn't hear someone preach from the phone book because my message was originally titled for day, Preaching from the Phone Book, Signs of the Times. Um, ended up scrapping that one. I've had this scripture in Matthew 17 on my heart for a while. Ended up at the altar of the church here praying about it. Should I give this message? And here we are. So I hope this is meaningful to someone. I've kind of felt led to continue on with this. So I scrapped the phone book message and here we are. On the topic of our culture and how we respond to things, this is an election year, and there's going to be a lot of people wanting the church to wade into politics. There's always people wanting the church to wade into social activism, social causes. This is always happening. It's not new. It's just not new. This has been happening for a long time. And we live in a day and age where our culture likes many effects of the gospel, but it doesn't want the gospel to be the source of those effects. And we find this with examples like the idea that people have value as an individual. You know, that that is a Christian idea that comes from Christianity, that comes from our Christian roots, which were taught to us by Christ Jesus. You go back 2,000 years ago, if you're living in Rome, Caesar doesn't care about you as an individual. And even when you look in Jewish tradition, the chances that the king is going to care much about you as an individual is just not very high, if I'm honest. Pharaoh doesn't care much about you. The idea that you as an individual have worth comes from the idea of being born again, Christ Jesus wanting to transform you. Um, The whole idea that you should be righteous as an individual, that your life needs to be continually transformed and perfected, all of these things are products of Christian living and a gospel worldview. And the church has bought into a lie. And yeah, I know we're doing a whole series with our full crew here, the seven deadly lies that the church has bought into. Um, One of the lies is that the church has bought into this idea that we can kind of impact the world without teaching the gospel as being the necessary source for the good things which come from God. Um, which again, God is the source, but we we act like we can just cut the gospel off from that. Like the good news of, of Christ Jesus isn't is something which is essential to our lives. That it's not something which was revealed to us. That it's just kind of there by accident. It wasn't put there with a pure purpose. The, the church has always been tempted to wade into the waters of political and social activism. However, Christ Jesus and his kingdom are bigger than these earthly affairs. Furthermore, what people believe is more important than their intentions. And this is a really important and novel idea. We should never think that good intentions are enough. And what largely happens with modern politics and the church is we buy into a lie that if we have people out there who are not in the church, or maybe they're people in the church who aren't really that interested in the gospel, but there are people who are interested in having similar intentions And we think, well, we'll just align ourselves with those people with similar intentions. This isn't what the gospel commands us to do. We are to reach out to people with the testimony of Christ Jesus that they may come to know him and to follow the way of life. Spiritual conversion to believe in Christ Jesus is far more powerful than mere alignment with motives and intentions. Whenever we just align ourselves with motives and intentions, that always comes back to bite the church and it will make you look like a fool in the end, so just don't do it. Christ Jesus cares about the souls of God's children, and we should as well. Our prime directive is to go out into the world to seek the lost, that they might accept Christ Jesus as their Savior. The gospel is what we are to preach, and sometimes this requires us to stand up against sins in the world. 
Whenever we're standing up against a sin and taking action to stop evil in the world, we must be taking action because the gospel commands us to do so. So there are going to be times where there's overlaps between um, reformations, between revolutions and things which happen in history and even movements that happen. But whenever we kind of grab onto them and we allow the secular side of things to take over, we have made a big mistake. Christ Jesus must be Lord of all the things we do, and we must always be living out the gospel. Certainly the gospel tells us that there's going to be sin and evil in the world that we've got to fortify ourselves against, and there's even going to be sin and evil in the world that we're to stand up against and fight against. But we cannot allow motives and good intentions which are not of God, but people believe they're good. We can't allow things which are disconnected from God and things which are resentful and do not want to be surrendered to God. We cannot allow those things to take priority. Furthermore, Whenever we're dealing with the world, we must be using the language of the gospel to call out things as evil and sinful and to point people to the hope and salvation and holiness that is found in Christ Jesus. Whether we're using King James English or NIV English, we need to be using the language of the gospel in our lives. And I know Anthony, this is one of the things which he was really um, wanting to make sure that we were clear on. Am I right? What it means when we say you've got to be using the language of, of the gospel. Yeah, I think um, all too often people try to use more secular language to communicate the same thing. Something I see a lot of time in uh, theology books is to refer to what the scriptures might call of the world or just the world or the kingdom of the world as the culture. And they sort of soften it up. They're like, oh, yeah, it's just the culture. It's just, you know, the way these people have sort of over history developed traditions and tr for treating one another and that sort of thing and so they sort of like soften it up but the way the gospel the way the bible the way scripture treats um what a lot of theologians refer to as culture is not in a very good light what's painted as to be of the world is painted to be what is on the path of death what is leading to the place of weeping and gnashing of teeth and there's no good connotations to find uh, with phrasing, with worldliness, with, you know, of the world, with world phrasing within the scriptures. And that is the language that uh, the scripture used to refer to what a lot of times people might call culture today. So when people switch up words, a lot of times they are uh, trying to soften things. It can be to... Um, change the way that things are painted in and it's what it's much easier if you give it a different name yeah it's it's easy to lie if you give things different names um but rather than us using the language of righteousness holiness sin christ likeness sanctification we hear people talk about things like privilege class warfare power things like that and all this stuff is not the language that the scriptures operate in, whether you're using King James English or NIV English. And we need to go back to using the language and the concepts, which is behind the language, because yes, I know none of us speak ancient Greek, but the concepts are what is so important. And there are English words which correctly and generally take us to those ideas. And we need to be using those rather than ones which come from other things, like whether they be coming from Marxism, whatever they may be. We as the church, we have to be getting back to what it really means to be Christians living in the gospel. And Jesus, one of the things which, which gets me is, is people act like Jesus, when he is teaching about this stuff, he's teaching in an outdated culture. Um, Jesus was not ignorant of the culture during his day and age. He was not oblivious to the convictions um, that were around him. He's, and he's not oblivious to the convictions of our modern culture that gives us things here in the year 2020. Jesus was not ignorant of the sexual proclivities of Roman culture, nor was he um, oblivious to the corruption that went on the various spheres of politics. Jesus realized all of these things were actually beneath the kingdom of God, and they were substantially less significant than every single heart that was out there in the world inside a child of God. Jesus cares about us as individual children, and the state of our souls is far more significant than an earthly state that is just a nation or kingdom. The kingdom of God is much more concerned with souls than it is with the earthly affairs. And the gospel, it teaches us against stumbling. Stumbling is a spiritual affair. Placing too much value on earthly affairs makes you prone to stumble. 
And it also puts you in a position where you can make others stumble. And this is not the calling of the church. It is wicked to call stumbling. The gospel pretty clearly teaches this. Last Sunday, I looked in Matthew 18. Today, we're going to be looking in Matthew 17. You know, it's wicked to call stumbling, whether you're causing someone else to stumble or you're causing yourself to stumble. It's wicked to desire to reach a goal by any means necessary, where you make compromises and you do wicked things because you think the end result has good intentions. It's wicked to manipulate people so that you can approach a desired goal yourself. And it's different to judge people as groups than it is to just have discernment on the world and to apply different standards to different groups and different peoples, that is wicked. It's, it's wicked to look at different groups and then judge them on that group thing. These are all things which are sinful. They are wicked. And I don't care which angle you think you're doing it, it is all wicked. We have a lot of people in the modern day and age. They, they look at different classes of people. They look at different races. And again, they're talking about this all the time. And they're they have become the monster they wanted to to defeat because rather than just rejecting the notion of of this full sale and looking at the gospel which teaches us that our identity is found in Christ they say yeah we need to be christians but also we have all of these other things that we must not just talk about but we must elevate them to the point where we say these are immutable these define who people are when our identity is supposed to be coming from Christ Jesus all of this is stumbling blocks and they are sinful and the gospel teaches us that it is better for someone to meet a torturous death than for them to set these stumbling blocks before others. So I hope we still have some listeners out there. And if so, please um, send us your thoughts, questions, and comments. We're going to get to Matthew 17 now. We're not going to be reading from the phone book. We can all be grateful for that. I think Anthony's grateful for that. Um, though I promise it was a more interesting message than you think. It was. If anybody needs to hear the phone book message, we'll give it. It was actually a little bit apocalyptic, signs of the time. So it's one of those juicy little um, teases for something which may never be given to fruition unless someone's curious about it. Um, Jesus, he wants us to be people who do not set stumbling blocks. We're going to be talking today a lot about stumbling blocks and scandal. Um, and the word that we get in the Greek, which is often translated as offense or stumble, because it's a pretty powerful word, and the root of it is where we get our English word scandal. So Anthony, would you read from Matthew 17, 24 through 27? When they reached Capernaum, the collectors of the temple tax came to Peter and said, Does your teacher not pay the temple tax? He said, Yes, he does. And when he came home, Jesus spoke of it first, asking, What do you think, Simon? From whom do kings of earth take toll or tribute? From their children or from others? When Peter said, from others, Jesus said to him, Then the children are free. However, so that we do not give offense to them, go to the sea and cast a hook. Take the fish, the first, that comes up, and when you open its mouth, you will find a coin. Take that and give it to them for you and for me. All right, I don't know about for Anthony, but this has always been a really interesting text to me. It always is one where I knew there had to be something more to it because I always felt like whenever I read this, and even when I was a, a young man, like a high schooler, I would read this to be like, what? there's got to be something more to this because it. how is it that Jesus is relating with the world? What's the deal with this coin? Who are the people collecting the tax? I hear all this language about tax collectors. There's a little bit language of temple tax and some different translations, and you read this and you're like, what is going on? Do you ever feel that way when you read this text, Anthony, just a little bit of a what is going on here? Oh, no, yeah, this is definitely a uh, very vague uh, excerpt from Matthew. Well, it may seem vague, but we're here to hopefully find some, some resolution to that. Again, I'm not going to explain all the mysteries here. I'm not, not a heretic, um, and if I, if I were a heretic, then people should excommunicate me. Um, Peter is confronted by people who want Jesus to step into the Jewish political sphere. All right, so we're going to spend some time looking what's really in this text, and that is one of the things which is really happening here. Peter is confronted by people who come. They recognize he's a teacher. Again, what they say there in verse 24 is, does your teacher not pay the temple tax? It's a simple question, but there's a lot of stuff built into that. One, they recognize Jesus is a teacher. They also kind of pull a real snobby, almost journalistic question where instead of just coming and saying, all right, we're here to collect the temple tax, they frame it. As if he's not. They, they kind of do this dirty trick of saying, does he not pay the temple tax? Implying that he's not going to. 
Again, they're kind of leading there with that question. They're wanting to see how this new teacher, this rabbi Jesus, how he's going to respond to this. And they're trying to get Jesus to step into the Jewish political sphere. Now, it's fascinating because Peter, when he hears this, his instinct is to return home to Jesus. Now, I actually think that's a pretty cool thing. Peter sometimes gets a bad rap. Um, he does some things that are seriously wrong. He denies Jesus. He has some issues with Paul later. Definitely there's some flaws in Peter's character. But, again, he's not the Savior. He's not the Messiah himself. He's just like you and I. He's called by the Messiah to come and follow him. Peter, in this moment, he does something which I think is pretty significant and we should not minimize. Peter, when confronted by the world, wanting Jesus to step into the political sphere, wanting the Christians to step into that, Peter's instinct is not to just immediately say whatever his thoughts are or to say his own opinions and give them a long discourse and talk about this stuff. His instinct is to return home to Jesus. And that's an aspect of discipleship that we cannot overlook. Peter has an impulse causing him to return to Jesus whenever he is challenged. And I think that's pretty cool. I think that's actually a, a pretty cool indicator of Peter's character, where sometimes we get some pretty bad ones. I don't know what Anthony thinks on, about that, but I'm, I'm kind of impressed with, with Peter's impulse that he has there. No, definitely. And I think um, today it's extraordinarily rare and I think really, really, for lack of a better thing to say, just downright beautiful to find someone who, whenever they find themselves in conflict, turn to prayer and the scriptures and to the church for that matter. Yeah. A lot of times uh, people will... It's almost like they'll be in their own box whenever they come into problems with life that they're just stuck in and they don't know what to think. They don't know what perspectives to take. They have no idea where on earth to start finding solutions. Yep. And um, if you turn to God and turn to the scriptures in the church, I think it'd be surprising just how that change in perspective can really start to uh, make things come together, I suppose. Yeah, absolutely. And that... That is really fascinating whenever you see somebody that has that faith like that. Again, Peter, he simply responds to him, yes, he does. They're obviously looking for a longer discourse. They're wanting to have some tension rebuttal. They're like the journalists who want to come over there with a gotcha question, and then they can run with their headline. That's what they're looking for, but Peter doesn't give it to him. He simply says enough to him to kind of dismiss the situation, and then he immediately returns to Jesus to see what Jesus has to say on the matter. It's a really, really impressive impulse and it's one that we should follow um it it certainly is because it takes us back to christ we're not doing this to give glory to peter but we're doing it because we are trying to give glory to god but jesus is the one who talks first jesus knows what's going on um and whenever peter gets home and jesus kind of responds to this jesus has some interesting things to say about it and this is where the word scandal comes in jesus says what do you think simon from whom do the kings of the earth take their toll or tribute? From the children or from others? And when Peter says from others, Jesus says, then the children are free. However, so that we do not give a fence to them. And that's where we get this word. What we have translated there in verse 27, so that we do not give a fence. The word offense in the modern day and age when we're giving this sermon has really come to mean something that you say that hurts someone else's feelings. And we've elevated uh, speech in a way that is not appropriate for the level of speech. Speech is one of the most powerful tools we have. It's how our brains really operate. It gives us a lot of ability to reason that you don't find in other creatures of God. I mean, we're created in the image of God, and the Word of God is very vital to, to God's uh, organization of creation. It's how He brings creation into being. And, of course, ultimately the Word of God is there, part of the Trinity. Christ comes and manifests as the, the Word of God. So the Word and language are very powerful, but at the same time, the Word of man is obviously not as powerful as the Word of God. And we have done something where... We have construed and contorted the power of language. And when it comes to something like being offended or offense, we've elevated things which realistically should be non-issues if people are mature into things which now are issues because people are, are sensitive to things which in the grand scheme of things don't have much significance um, unless they're indicative of a larger worldview. And then it's that worldview that's the problem. But anyways, what we see happening here, what is translated as offense, could be translated as stumble. The word that you get there in the Greek is this word, skandalizomen, 
which has the root scandal. And this is where our English word scandal comes from. Now, this is the same root word that will be used a few verses later when Jesus is talking about causing the little ones to stumble. And you might have translations that use the word offense there in chapter 18. But the word that is being used here is the word which means to call someone to stumble. Essentially what Jesus is saying in that verse there in 27, he says, however, so that we do not give cause for them to stumble. Now that has a very different meaning here in the modern day and age than if you say that we do not give offense. Jesus is really saying that we do not cause them to stumble, to force them into a scandal. Um, we pay this. And this is interesting because, again, back what we said when we first read through this text, there's a lot of questions we have on this. Like, is Jesus making a moral compromise? Does he just want to appease them? Because that's what you might walk away from this taking. And that really is something which needs some further investigation because we know that Jesus is not one to compromise things which are of eternal value and to compromise anything with moral issues or things of that nature. So we need to really find clarity on what is going on here, and we need to do some sincere digging and find out what's going on in this text. So one final thing that we know from this, and just to talk about the fish for a second, the fish is pretty significant because it shows that Jesus is bigger than the kings of the earth and the taxes and tributes they collect from others. Just as God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham, Jesus is able to raise up taxes from the mouths of fish. Pretty fascinating. Well, let's talk about the temple tax. Because we hear a lot of language of tax collectors, things like that. Well, what exactly is this temple tax? I mean, it's a question I have. I know Anthony says over there it's one which kind of feels vague if you don't know what the temple tax is. So the temple tax is actually something which comes from Exodus chapter 30, verses 13 through 16. And now you'll find it a couple of other times in the Old Testament. I know in the book of Nehemiah, you see people coming to, to pay the temple tax. But if you go to Exodus chapter 30, verses 13 through 16, you find the origins of the temple tax. And there in Exodus chapter 30, the Lord, so God himself, is speaking to Moses and he institutes the temple tax. So giving the temple tax is a law of God. And here's what Exodus 30 says. This is what each one who is registered shall give, half a shekel according to the shekel of the sanctuary. Half a shekel is an offering to the Lord. Each one who is registered from 20 years old and upward shall give the Lord's offering. The rich should not give more, and the poor shall not give less than half the shekel. When you bring this offering to the Lord to make atonement for your lives, you shall take the atonement money from the Israelites and shall designate it for the service of the tent of meeting before the Lord, and it will be a reminder to the Israelites of the ransom given for your lives. So what we learn from Exodus is that all Adult men who were over the age of 20 are required to give the temple tax. Now, this tax, it doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor, it is the same amount. And in the time of Jesus, it's um, what they consider about two days wages on average ways worth. But again, it's not different whether you're rich or poor. Um, it's not prorated to, to whatever your income is. It's just flat, same everywhere. And God has given this commandment that all men of 20 years old and older, they're to give this as a remembrance that they were bought out of Egypt, their ransom there when they were liberated, and it is used for the upkeep of the tent of meeting, which later becomes the temple there in Jerusalem. So Jesus is fully God and fully man. The two natures are simultaneously one, and they have come together for a singular purpose. The man nature of Jesus does not break the laws that were instituted by the God nature. And so often we do see people try to use the law against Jesus, but do you ever actually see Jesus breaking the law? And the answer is no. You see times where they want to technically say that Jesus has broke the law, but you never see Jesus breaking the spirit of the law, and you never see Jesus doing something which is against the laws of God and against the nature of God. Jesus, the man side, always follows the things which are inst instituted by the God nature. Jesus is ultimately giving glory to God by participating in the laws that were given directly by God. This is not a legalistic interpretation of the law that follows the law only in technicality but abuses the spirit of the law. Instead, the temple tax is actually very cut and dry. All adult men are to contribute a set amount to the upkeep of the house of God. Whether they're poor or wealthy, they all contribute the same amount. So when you see that happening here, um, if Jesus doesn't give the temple tax, you get one of these scenarios where you've got the man nature in Jesus 
not following the law of the God nature in Jesus. And that does create a bit of a scandal in and of itself. And it's not one that is scandal in just technicality, like a lot of people will come along and say, ah, Jesus, you healed that man on the Sabbath. You're not supposed to be doing that. And Jesus says, well, what what is the purpose of the Sabbath? You know, what what's better to do here, to give life or take it away? And obviously the whole purpose of the Sabbath is to give life and healing someone is following that that spirit and the purpose and the reason why God instituted it. Well, the temple tax, too, is one of those things where it's for the upkeeping of the temple. And Jesus says, you know, we're not going to cause a scandal on these people. We're not going to force them into a scandal. We're here to pay the, the temple tax as well. And again, it is something which is instituted by God. And we know that people, they can do wicked things when they take the law and they twist it and they contort it and they use it in like technical ways, which it really wasn't meant to. This is really not one of those cases. It's actually one of the times when it is fairly cut and dry when you know what the temple tax is. So let's get back to talking about our culture and how we can do things to help affect our culture and what we learn from this text. So far, what we have seen is people begging Jesus to step into the politics of Jewish culture. And Jesus, he says, look, those who are really obsessed with that, like these temple um, tax collectors are, um, you know, if you, you can easily give offense, you can easily set a stumbling block before them. And one of the pieces of logic we can pull out of this is that whenever people are super obsessed with the earthly affairs and they, they move away from the spirit of what God has called us to and the truth and the objective truth of God's law, they're easily found in stumbling blocks. We in our own lives, we realize that stumbling blocks, they can come everywhere. This is sort of the scandal which Jesus is talking about, that word that which we have translated as offense or stumbling. It is this idea that there's something which comes to cause you to sin, to do things which you're not supposed to do. And we as Christians, we know that we are not called to indulge in these things. We want to be people who are doing things in the world which move people towards God, where we're teaching the gospel. And one of the questions people have is, how do we ensure that we really are doing this? And the effects of our actions are the best, or excuse me, the effects of our actions are best predicted by the belief system you hold. Your motives and your intentions have less to do with the outcome of your actions than do your belief system. It doesn't take a lot of experience in life to make you realize that you can make big mistakes even if you have good intentions or what you believe are good intentions. Moreover, people can do really wicked things when they sincerely believe they are operating under good intentions. What matters more than just good intentions is having the right belief system, having Christ as Lord in your life, which is why earlier I started this off reading the Babylon B article and referencing a little bit how so many times people want to align with other people. They want to get in politics and social movements and say, yeah, even though we have different belief systems, you know, we're kind of coexisting together and we have similar intentions, even though we have different belief systems. So therefore we can be allies. The gospel doesn't tell us to do that. Instead, the gospel tells us to preach the good news, to bring people to where they can meet Christ Jesus. It is Christ who saves them, but we are commissioned as the church to be spreading the good news and testifying to the authority of Christ Jesus. And we know that it's not just enough to align with good intentions or what we believe are good intentions. Um, when I'm giving this message, it's right at the time of the new year, and we know that new year's resolutions often fail. We see that relationships come apart even when people have good motives and they have intentions of them staying together? You might ask, why do those things happen? And the answer is simple, because having good intentions, having motives to do something are not the same thing as having a belief system which is structured to make that happen. We need the power of the gospel to have truly good intentions, and we can only do this if Christ is Lord of our life. Our belief system in Christ Jesus is far more powerful than just our intentions. It's the nature of our actions that determine how they affect the world, and our belief system is the best predictor, and I, again, I want to emphasize that word predictor and how we respond to various situations. Peter, in this text, his life was organized around his relationship with Jesus, and therefore, when someone presented him with a tantalizing opportunity to weigh in on the politics of the temple text, his first move was to return home to Jesus. Suddenly, when Peter goes there, his opinion is not really of great importance. Jesus is there to speak first. He shows him the instructions and the question for Peter that he has to deal with is, can he accept what Jesus is going to say? So what we learn from this really is that 
we need that impulse that tells us to return back to Jesus, to let him be God of our life. And if we really want to help shape our culture around, again, we're not to make ourselves out to be idols and say that everything rests on our shoulders. But if we want to be instrumental in preaching the good news and having truly righteous transformation in the world around us, then the best way to do that is to be preaching the gospel. The gospel is going to do more to shape politics and culture than cultural or political activism. Now, that is just a basic fact. So gospel living is really about following the teachings of Christ Jesus. We must be faithful to Christ, and we must be fortified against stumbling blocks. So that's where we're going to wrap this up. And um, I don't know if Anthony has any final thoughts on this, but it is just important to see stumbling blocks are out there. I know it's an election year, and there's this great temptation to wade into politics. If you want to make a positive impact on things that is actually positive and is therefore from God, we need to do it by simply preaching the gospel. Anthony, any thoughts on this? I'm trying to get it more well articulated, but... The pregnant pause. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, all I can say is that the world comes not only to throw stumbling blocks in front of you, but in such a way to where if you respond in the way that the world has proposed very frequently, you will further cause the world to stumble because you've given credence to whatever sort of questions they're coming to you with. And so the best thing to do is really the right thing, the way that Jesus does. And um, that takes a lot of time and patience. It takes controlling your tongue. And it takes being able to think of God and what he wants in those moments also. Um, just look at the way that Jesus responds to people who come to challenge him. And it's really amazing. Um, he really never once stoops down to their level. And I don't just mean if they're throwing stones, Jesus doesn't throw stones. I mean more along the lines of, you know, they come in the name of something. The government the law, whatever. And Jesus says, no, I serve the living God. So I've come to you in the name of God. And then goes on from that standpoint. And that in itself can really um, just, you know, living almost really prayerfully, prayerfully living can really uh, be enough to change the way that you are able to serve Christ as one who proclaims the gospel. Yes, and as we come through these next few months and, and whatever happens in the world, there are going to be people begging you. There are going to be people in the church, I promise. Um, whether you see them on TV, on the Internet, you hear about it on the radio, there are going to be people, maybe even your own local church, who want you to wade into politics and to get on board with some sort of political or cultural activism. They want to get on the social movement of the day, say we need all this stuff. If you want to make true change in this world, you have to surrender your life to Christ Jesus and be willing to preach his gospel. You do not have to get on board with all this stuff. That doesn't mean that you're ignoring it. If you really want to have righteous transformation in the world, it comes from preaching the gospel of Christ Jesus, not by lobbing on to all this stuff, which is really just going to make you look like a fool in the end. We have all these people who want to elevate this stuff, and it becomes idolatrous, and it is very, very unfortunate. It falls and becomes a stumbling block. And that's not who we're called to be. We're called to be people who bring the, the world the good news, and we do it because Christ came and died for us, and we have had the good news taught to us. We're not better than anyone, but we are looking to spread the good news so that hearts and minds can be saved. Well, with that, thank you for joining us. Again, we are Kingdom of the Logos, and send us your thoughts, questions, and comments, and we hope you've had a good day. With that, God love you.